I'm Ann Charles. I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Keith Ghostland. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. We are taping on Tuesday, November 15th. And as we always say, our show is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous lands. Now that Anne is going to be taking us to far and distant places and telling us things we don't want to know. Not all of it's not <laughs> You've all You've got bad. some good stuff? No, I do. Okay. I have a lot of She's fluff. got animal stuff. <gasps> I've got animals. I've got beauty pageants. Um, How can we go wrong? <laughs> that's right. But let's start with a bad story, um, story of redress from Australia. Um, a new Australian commission is examining the infamous string of anti-gay murders. Um, you may recall that in the late 70s, um, gay men were murdered in Australia. Um, between 76 and 2000, uh, it took these murders, 80 plus unsolved deaths occurred on the picturesque cliffs surrounding Bondi Beach and Manly in New South Wales. Both areas were popular meeting places for men looking to have sex with other men during this period. Uh, this commission, two other commissions, have um, convened to investigate these murders, but they all disagree. And some of them called them hate crimes, some of them investigated only 33 of the 80. So now this third commission has um, of inquiry has convened and their um, authorities are hoping it'll be more definitive. In the opening statement, the senior counsel, um, Peter Gray, encouraged individuals with knowledges, knowledge of the crimes to come forward. If you have had something weighing on your mind for years about these things, now is your chance to do something to make amends, he said in a statement. Now is the time to break your silence. Now, you may recall the um, case of the American Scott Johnson, whose brother stayed on the case. And um, finally, this person, Scott White, 52, declared himself guilty, was sentenced to 12 years. He now identifies as gay, by the way. But now he's appealing his conviction and blaming his ex-wife for his declaration of guilt. <laughs> so that's a mess. But um, Gray, <coughs> Mr. Gray says, justice in these cases has been long delayed and long awaited. This may be the last chance for the truth about some of these historical deaths to be exposed. We need to hear from anyone who can help us do that. You know, I heard this discussion on some news show, I can't remember what it was, but they were talking about this and they thought that it might be like gangs of young men who Chased. just did this as like, oh, let's grab a gay person and throw them over the thing, over the cliff. So there was some discussion that it was, might be, that that might be part of what this is. And I think you might have heard it on Gay USA. Maybe. With Marin Johns, who is from Australia. Right. Yep. I was going to say, when you first reported that story a year or two ago, some of the commentary was, you know, the gang theory is they weren't grabbing them and throwing them. They were chasing gay men, so they had to jump off. It could be either or yeah. both, yeah. yeah. Well, I have more upbeat story from Good. Australia now. Uh, gay penguins are back together just in time for mating season. So I have a picture before you now of three gay penguins with a very militant sign. <laughs> <laughs> um, and two of the penguins who may be pictured, it doesn't really say, but the two in question are hoping that one day they may be foster parents, the keeper says. A same-sex pair of penguins has reunited for mating season in Sea Life Melbourne Australia Aquarium. According to this penguin keeper, Emily Thornton, two of the aquarium's male Gentoo penguins, Klaus and Jones, have been building nests together for about three or four years now. Initially, they started building their nests in the wrong area. 
But this year, for the first time, they've actually put in put it in the nesting platform area. They've assimilated, <laughs> which is really exciting, according to Emily Thornton. There are a couple that we're we're hoping one day might actually be foster parents, although same-sex male pairs are unable to fertilize and lay an egg between themselves. Klaus and Jones can be given a dummy egg to protect to protect during the nesting period so they can practice being dads. <laughs> Same sex now I've reported at length, but let's review. Same sex penguin couples have paired off in zoos all over the world. Yep. Penguins conduct homosexual relationships that can last a whole lifetime. This is according to biologist Gunter Strauss, who explained in 2019 uh, that the Munich Zoo he issued this explanation because the Munich Zoo highlighted a male couple of Humboldt penguins during Pride Month. And there are all different kinds of species of penguins that you will learn about. For example, other notable <laughs> examples include Sven and Magic. Oh, I remember them. I remember them, too. Them. At Sydney Sea Life Aquarium, Ronnie and Reggie at uh, ZSL London Zoo, Zoo and Thelma and Re Louise at Sea Life Aquarium, New Zealand. Roy and Silo, a homosexual chin strap penguin couple, are at New York Central Park Zoo. They even inspired a children's book called Entango Makes Three after they successfully hatched an egg given to them by zookeepers. I have a copy. Do you? I absolutely. Oh, you should have brought it in. Had I known. I know it. Well, maybe next time. It'll okay. come up again, I'm oh, certain. We love the penguins. There's more. Same-sex penguin couples frequently foster eggs and chips, chicks, sometimes stealing eggs and whole nests from heterosexual couples. One pair of male Magellanic penguins has been dubbed the San Francisco Zoo's star parents. In 2019, Ocean World Aquarium Dingle in Ireland reported that most of the, its penguins had paired off into same-sex couples. So there we have it. All right. Happy penguins. Exciting news from the animal kingdom. Now let's go to Israel. I have a lot of um, stories from Asia, so I'll get started on them right now. Uh, as we know, um, Benjamin Netanyahu has been re-elected uh, head of Israel, and he has... Uh, vowed to protect LGBTQ rights, although members of his party have been threatening otherwise. Legislators in the Knesset promised to eliminate pride parades, remove a ban on conversion therapy, and endanger transgender medical care. Benjamin Netanyahu, the former Israeli prime minister who's recently uh, been elected as chairman of the majority Likud party, within his country's legislature, the Knesset, has promised not to allow legislators to roll back LGBTQ rights in the country. There will be no harm to pride parades or to, or to the, nor to the status quo to LGBTQ rights, he said. Observers worried that the conservative political leader would try to create a coalition uh, and curry the favor with these whole slew of anti-LGBTQ lawmakers. Uh, for example, a senior Likud source um, said that Netanyahu's party plans to reverse LGBTQ medical rights instated by the outgoing health minister. Mm -hmm. Those rights include insurance coverage for gender-affirming health care, a ban on so-called conversion therapy, and reimposing a ban on gay male blood donations. Additionally, this Avi Maus, uh, chairman of the pro-family Noam party, said we will look into canceling the pride parade legally. Who holds a public pride parade that is all provocation? Do you know how offensive such a parade in Jerusalem is to us? He, his party is one of three political parties that make up the far-right religious Zionism political faction. It's not only anti-LGBTQ, it also has 14 seats in the 120-seat Knesset. As such, it's expected that Netanyahu's going to have to work with them. Yeah. Uh, the LGBTQ chair of the 
task force in Israel said we are being put to the test as a community and as a country. But the organizer of the organization Passages of the, to the Trans Spectrum said that repealing LGBTQ rights is more of an easily made campaign promise than an achievable reality. So let's hope he's right. I did hear about that. Why don't you do one more story and then we'll move on. To Very good. <laughs> and it involves a clip. <laughs> Another right. Israeli ah. story. Um, this is a clip of a film, a drama, involving Ben and Roz painstakingly pursuing their desire to have a child in the migrant neighborhood where the gay couple has set up their new flat is on the up and up, but a conflict over a newly planted tree in the city brings deep-seated prejudices to light. Concerned Citizens is the name of this film. It was released in 2022. It has a good rating. Uh, it's a feature-length film with a runtime of one hour and 22 minutes. So let's take a look at a clip from Concerned Citizen. Good clip. Interesting. You can't yeah. find it anywhere, so keep ah. your eyes peeled, audience, because it'll Must turn be up. Or mm -hmm. maybe it'll turn up. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ian. My great pleasure. And I guess on the top of our list is the Senate is expected to vote this week on legislation to codify same-sex marriage. And more importantly, the bill has enough GOP support to pass. We have the votes, a source close to negotiations confirmed Monday. A bipartisan group of senators has been trying for months to pass a marriage equality bill to protect same-sex inter racial relationships. The House passed its own legislation in July, but that proposal stalled in the Senate, where some Republicans raised concern that it would stifle religious liberty. Things got more complicated when around the same time, uh, Senator Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat New York, and Senator Joe Manchin, Democrat West Virginia, announced a surprise deal on a massive tax and climate change bill. Republicans were so mad at the Democrats, they were ready to pass that deal without them, that some signaled they would pull their support for the forthcoming same-sex marriage bill. But with the midterm elections over and Democrats in a position to hold the Senate for another two years, it looks like some Republicans are coming back to the table. Senator Tammy Baldwin, <coughs> Democrat from Wisconsin, the lead Democrat on the forthcoming bill tweeted Monday that the Senate is going to get this done. So, All right. Well, and it will also be interesting to see what happens during this lame duck process before the new one comes in, because that's where we, <coughs> when we got Obamacare, mm -hmm. is that they knew that they were going to lose the majority in, in both chambers. So what can we get through now right. while we know we have the votes? So, so good. And then there's an interesting story about Virgin Atlantic has uh, ditched its gender uniform policy. Women can wear pants, men can wear skirts. A job application have skyrocketed. The company has reported that the number of applications filed with the airline has doubled since the impending <coughs> and new more inclusive policy. While other airlines struggle to fill uh, staff vacancy, Virgin has no issue recruiting the best um, on um, the best on the dustbin and so have 
other sexual requirements. Female cabin crew is no longer required to wear makeup. Tat um, they can have tattoos, can be visible. The staff are now allowed to wear gender pronoun badges. Pronoun badges will also be available to the customers who can ask for one at any check-in desk. Customers with gender-neutral markers on their passports <coughs> will also now be able to select gender-neutral markers for their booking tickets. That's so there great. you go. Right. right. And then we have a story about, and I have a picture here, of a puppeteer in a leather bar are under fire in oh, Chicago for the puppeteer's racist performance featuring a black puppet. Last week, puppeteer, puppeteer Jerry Halliday was booked for an anniversary show at the Touche Bar in Chicago, Rogers Park neighborhood. The gay comics act that night featured one of his rotating ensemble of characters, Sister Girl, a black woman trapped inside a white man's body by Halliday's description at the show. So. Hmm. And he's white, the puppeteer. So. Mm -hmm. um, and on another delightful note, a hate preacher who called for teachers he claimed were grooming kids for uh, kids to be beheaded on a TV show so that that far-right Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican of Georgia, is a fake conservative because she's not at home being obedient to her husband. Yeah. Isn't she divorced? <laughs> yeah. I guess she doesn't know that. A new okay. independent fundamentalist Baptist preacher at Shore Foundation Baptist Church in Spokane, Washington, made his comments about Green during a recent sermon about the midterm elections. If we have this red wave, Grabber began using the term for the expected wave of Republicans mm -hmm. uh, victories, which they didn't get, are they going to do anything? Are they gonna, going to pass, you know, the abortion ban nationwide and have all abortion doctors retroactively put to death? Are they going to do that? No. Why? Because they're cowards. The so-called conservative women, why are we putting them in a position of leadership when they can't even figure out which good husband to marry? Because any husband that allows his wife to go and run for Congress is a pathetic beta man. Okay, that is wrong. That is wicked. There's something wrong with that man. He shouldn't show his face in public. He should be so embarrassed. I have an addendum about Marjorie Taylor Greene's marital status. Her husband has filed for divorce after 27 years. This occurred on September 29th. Well, I can't say I blame him. It's because she wasn't at home in her weekend. <laughs> I don't know. I can't speculate further. I heard she read had a couple of affairs. That's what I heard, but. Well, I'm not going there, and you can't make me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can move on. Okay. <laughs> Pundit Matt Walsh is f fond of exaggeration and twisting the truth, but on Monday nights, the Joe Ro Ro Rogan oh, Experience okay, Rogan. podcast, he told a whopper so big that even the host called it bullshit. He claimed that millions of American children had been put on hormone blockers. But when Rogan's producer, Wade, and with the fact check that proved Walsh was lying, the Daily Wire host was forced to admit that he had made it up. So, In an interview in Fox News host Tucker Carlson, right-wing journalist, we all know him, uh, Jason Whitlock, mocked House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her husband Paul after the latter was brutally attacked in the home with a hammer. A man broke into Pelosi's San Francisco home in October and asked, where's Nancy, before he beat Paul Pelosi with a hammer. Paul Pelosi was able to call 911, and he was hospitalized following the brutal attack. Whitlock was referring to the conservative conspiracy theory that DePage is not only Paul Pelosi's gay lover. DePage being the assailant. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but also a promoter of progressive causes like Black Lives Matter. So, oh. 
A person smashed a window of a donut shop in Oklahoma and threw a mo Molotov cocktail inside in retaliation to shop hosting shows about uh, and hosting a drag queen event. Yeah. Video posted on Facebook shows the unidentified person taping a paper to the door of the donut shop in Tulsa at 2.30 a.m. Monday morning and then smashing the glass um, and throwing a mo Molotov cocktail inside. So he was wearing a mega hat, <laughs> they think. So, and I'll do one more and then I'll move on to you. All right. All right. A troubled individual who went to an anti-gay arson rampage in New York last summer has been indicted for enhanced hate crime charges. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg announced the additional charges on Tuesday. Alex Bl Blodgett was originally indicted last September for a series of arson and related attacks on, in August 2021 on Manhattan's west side. Following the arraignment, arraignment, a search warrant of the defendant's Facebook account was signed and executed, yielding evidence that demonstrated an anti-gay animus, particularly towards gay men and establishments geared for LGBTQ plus community, according to the district attorney. So, mm. Okay. So we're going to start with the trivia question that they got without hesitation, and I'm expecting the same of you. This was the first openly LGBTQ plus person elected to a state legislature. And I'm glad you're still on it. <laughs> so looking at events, Sunday, November 20th, would be the day after this show's airs. State House Lawn? 4 to 6 p.m., Transgender Day of Remembrance. Hmm. Major event. And following that, you know, come over to Fox Market where they're going to do a community gathering. Okay. You know, a little more time with each other. And looking at the weather, you're going to need to be indoors <laughs> to be warm. Thursday, December 1st, is International AIDS Awareness Day. And at the Susan Calza Gallery on 138 Main Street here in Montpelier, they're going to be showing our friend John Kalaki's AIDS Trilogy. And these are three shorts that he created during the 90s at the height of the AIDS epidemic. There will be shows at 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30, and 7, because each video is brief. So they will show the three. I think they said a half hour for the whole. Mm -hmm. Each the each, whole presentation, the whole pres block. Yeah. But you know yeah. they're scheduling it half an hour apart. So I'm thinking there's a little wiggle room in there. Yeah. Rainbow umbrella. You're you're having some interesting conversations in the women's discussion groups. I'm <laughs> I'm enjoying immensely watching your notes. Good. So if you're interested, be in touch. And you've still got the book discussion yes, group do. going on. Very good. So. Let's talk about the difference a country can make when it comes to, you know, in our South, we've got people trying to do a legislative ban on drag queen story hours, you know, trans youth, et cetera. Canada, and thank you to Anne for throwing these stories my way. Canada versus the world, RuPaul drag race. Their guest is going to be Justin Trudeau. <laughs> and th apparently th there was a U.S. versus the world drag race, and Nancy Pelosi was on as a promotion for the election. <laughs> Canada, Justin stepping up. <laughs> and you know this was the comment from the participants is, the stakes are high and the heels higher. <laughs> so I, I think that's one okay, to definitely yeah. go out and look for. And the other, and I'm going to ask you if you know the, the author. The, it's a queer author, Suzette, and I'm presuming it's Mayer. Yeah. Won the biggest literary prize in Canada. And this was the Scotiabank Giller Prize for her novel, The Sleeping Car Porter. And I want to go find a copy of this. 
because you know there was the brief narrative about Suzette that she has been writing for years just under the surface. She was a a writer's writer, mm -hmm. so she didn't get a whole lot of mainstream appeal. But this story, The Sleeping Car Porter, the story of Baxter, a closeted gay man working as a porter on a Canadian passenger train in 1929, Baxter finds a provocative postcard of two queer men and his desires come to the surface. It, it sounds like one of your clips. And, and this is what the author said about the book. I really wanted to do with this book was call attention to the lost history of LGBTQIA2S plus folk and our essential contributions to history because of societal pressure, <clears throat> previous generations of queer folk had to hide and some did a very good job of it. Mm -hmm. So thank you for passing it on. I, th I think we need to get a copy and pass it yeah, on ourselves so we can report back. So in my next segment, I'm going to go on to the election. You were expecting it, of course. So that's what I've got for now. OK. I'm still in Asia. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, good things are going on, for example involving beauty pageants, in mm -hmm. particular the Miss Universe pageant yes. has just been bought by Anne Jacafong Jaka Juta Tip, and there's a picture before you now of Anne, 43. Um, she's a transgender business mogul um, who just made history as the first woman to own the global beauty pageant Miss Universe. Uh, She's the first woman in its 71-year history. This news, which was shared by her company, marks an incredible milestone for the multimillionaire. Oh. Um, she bought it for $20 million, wow. according to NBC. Gee. She's known for supporting trans awareness in Thailand by setting up the Life Inspired for Transsexual Foundation, which advocates for transgender rights. Though she had a tough childhood and started her career as a, at a gas station, she is now the chief executive officer of a top con content management and distribution company in Thailand. She has two kids via surrogacy. In a Thai interview, she spoke about the difficulties of having children via surrogacy in Thailand, explaining that she had to fly to Greece to make it happen, and she also revealed that she had to spend a total of $800,000 oh. in U.S. money to have her two children. With her massive business empire, she's said to be one of Southeast Asia's wealthiest trans women. Wow, there you go. More beauty pageant news. Um, I'd like to report on a, for fun. A, a former Miss Argentina and an ex-Miss Puerto Rico who've announced on Instagram Instagram over the weekend that they were married. And let's take a look now at a picture of Mariana Varela of Argentina, 29, and Fabriola Valentin, 22, of Puerto Rico. After deciding to keep our relationship private, we now open our doors to a special day. The message included what appeared to be their wedding date, October 28th, along with heart and ring emojis. The video included their post, uh, in their post features a montage of them traveling, their candlelit marriage proposal, and a kiss outside the courthouse in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Varela and Valentina appear to have met last March when they competed in the Miss Grand International Beauty Pageant in Thailand. In an Instagram photo of the two women embracing, that Valentine posted the following week, she wrote, one of the great gifts in this experience was your friendship. Walking this process with you was a special and real one. I miss you, my girl. Neither woman took home the top prize in the competition, but they mo both made it into the top 10. Since well, they got the best prize. That's right. <laughs> Since connecting last year, they've spent time traveling together and even dropped subtle hints of their love on social media 
by posting a few photos throughout the past 18 months before making their public announcement. In just three days, the video announcing their union amassed more than 116,000 likes and 2.6 million views on Instagram. The comment section was also quickly filled with support from fans and fellow pageant queens. Same, all right, this background. Same-sex marriage has been legal in Puerto Rico since 2015 as a result of the Supreme Court's decision, which we know about, or Burkefell. It's also legal in much of Latin America, including Argentina. And just last week, as we know, same-sex marriage officially became legal in all of the Mexican states. So they're very excited. And May I just briefly comment that Reporting on beauty pageants is the last thing that I thought I would hear from Professor Charles. I know, but I know, I know. A lot of how things thing, apparently. How things change. Um, and I covered, I mentioned that in Asia, because included in the Asian news because the pageant took the marriage. It all took place in Thailand, even though it's kind of a world story. More um, from Asia. Tokyo begins issuing same-sex couples partnership certificates. And now I have a picture before you of Mamiko, M Mamiko Moda on the left and her partner Sadoko N Nagabura, who were among the first to pick up their marriage certificate. Tokyo has begun rolling out these marriage certificate schemes to same-sex couples, allowing them to be treated as married couples for certain public services for the first time, but falling short of marriage equality. Some hope this may be a step toward the whole of Japan embracing equality. It's currently the only, as I've said often, it's currently the only country in the G7 group of developed nations that doesn't recognize same-sex unions. However, recent polling suggests that Jap Jap the majority of Japanese people support gay marriage. Despite the widespread report, a district court in Osaka ruled earlier this year that the existing ban on same-sex marriage was constitutional. Then in October, a local representative for the ruling Democratic, uh, Liberal Democratic Party called same-sex marriage disgusting. The comments were widely criticized. The partners the partnership certificates, which have also been introduced in eight other prefectures in Japan, allow, will allow same-sex couples to be treated the same as married couples when it comes to housing, medicine, and welfare. But they will not help with issues like adoption, inheritance, and spousal visas. Anyone over 18 who either lives or works in Tokyo is allowed to apply with 137 applications having been submitted by Friday. Good news. I think they'll get there. It'll just take time. I know. They're inching forward. I, now, do you have a must-tell story? Because we're going to have to move on. We're going to run out of time. OK, let me do some headlines. Um, Erdogan in Turkey wants to, um, so is supporting a constitutional amendment to protect families against perverse trends. We know who he's talking about. And I don't know why he's doing this if he wants to be in the EU. I don't think they do anymore. A court in Slovakia recognizes a married same-sex couple. And a same-sex couple's win in Polish court. Let's see a picture of them there. Jakub Kuzinski and Dawid Majcik. Um They got a sort of... Um, a victory in the court, sort of. Uh, there is um, a provision that says marriage is between a man and a woman and a woman, but the judge said, yeah, but that doesn't mean it's only between a man and a woman. So people are disagreeing, but um, they're vloggers and activists, and they're um, viewing the decision, um, their approval of their marriage, even though it's kind of provisional, they're bringing that as a victory. Thank you. My great pleasure. We have a, a good story, which is Black Panther. Wakanda Forever is already gearing up to be a massive hit. With star Latita Latidia Wright filling in as 
the is it titular hero? Titular, and titular. it's Letitia, I think. Yeah, Letitia. Okay. After the passing of her brother, King T'Challa, in the new film, T'Challa was played by the beloved actor actor Chad Chadwick Boseman, who we all loved who succumbed to cancer in 2020. A new star entering uh, the MCU is Michaela Coel, the screenwriter and actress known for the critically acclaimed, acclaimed series I May Destroy You. Coel stars as Aneka, a member of the Dora Milaha, a group of fierce female soldiers protecting Wakanda. Please, if I've... This. I was going to say, that should have been your story just for the pronunciation alone. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the film, Aneka shares a tender moment with fellow fighter <coughs> Oya, Aya, Florence Kusamba. There's no mistaking the women are in a relationship. Oh, that, I was uh, waiting for the lesbian angle. Aneka uh -huh. and Ejos uh, are queer, of course is not imagined. The two characters were indeed written as queer in the 2007 comic, and their forbidden relationship was a significant part of its plot. Anika's sexual identity was also a big reason that Michaela Cowell decided to take on the part. Uh, relationship was explored in the Panther spin-off comic book written by bisexual author Roxanne Gay. Oh, right. So, um, uh, they're not, they're now, of course, it's being banned in China. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's just a kiss on the forehead. I mean, it's not like it's a passionate. But it's clear that there's it's clear a passionate that, underpinning. Yes, yes. So, when are you so, going to see it? Well, as soon as it comes to the theater, is it here now? I think well, it I might have been. Checked. I know. All right. Um, so, Kevin Conroy, the man behind the gra gravely bass voice of Batman, oh. and who has popularized that unmistakable growl that separated Bruce Wayne from the caped crusader, has died. According to his representative, Gary Mir Mirnanu, he was 66. DC Comics also confirmed the news. Was he gay? Yes. And now there's another movie or another um, documentary or about um, Whitney Houston. Uh, and it's making us fall in love with the icon all over again, according to sources. You might end up watching the trailer multiple times. We don't blame you. I tried to get it, but I couldn't. Known for Eve's Bayou and most recently Harriet, I want to dance with someone, somebody centers. Houston's rise to fame as she pushes through backlash as a black woman singer in a predominantly white genre and emerges as, as a legend. It also has her relationship with the woman she was seeing Good. during that time. So that should be interesting. The mother of a gay man who was robbed and killed under suspicious circumstances in New York City earlier this week, this year, broke her silence this week, calling out Manhattan's new district attorney for refusing to prosecute her son's alleged murderers. A gang suspected of uh, prying on young gay men in Hell's Kitchen. Linda Clary told the New York Post District Attorney Alvin Bragg is dragging his feet on bringing charges against the suspected killers of her son. John Umberger, 33, of Washington, D.C., who was drugged, robbed, and murdered after a night out visiting gay bars in Hell's Kitchen in May. The same gang of men is believed responsible for the April death of Brooklyn social worker Julio Ramirez, 25, who also died under suspicious circumstances after being drugged and robbed in the area and at least a dozen more gay men who were also drugged and robbed. I can't be quiet anymore. Word needs to get out, especially in the gay community, that they are targeting gay men, Linda Kellery told the Post later, adding, 
This same group of killers have drugged, robbed, and murdered countless young gay men in New York. You know, so. Alvin Bragg is a problematic figure. I mean, he's been, he failed to prosecute Trump. Yeah. Several people on his staff quit because of it. Yeah. I mean, you know. So he's not. Right. Yeah. Highly problematic figure. Yeah. One day after the 20. 2022 midterm elections proved that Republican efforts to paint LGBTQ people as groomers and dangerous to children failed. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Tennessee lawmakers doubled down on their anti-LGBT sentiment by introducing two bills targeting the community. State lawmakers introduced Senate Bill 1 and Senate Bill 3 on Wednesday. They would prohibit doctors and families from making unnecessarily life-saving health care decisions to support transgender youth. Meanwhile, SB3 would make performing drag in public where children can see it a crime. Tennessee Majority Leaders William Lambert and Jack Johnson introduced HB and SB1 called the Protecting Children from Gender Mutilation Act. Any medical intervention that alters the child's hormonal balance and any procedure that enables them to identify as a different gender than that assigned at birth would be illegal under this bill and would anyone who violates in its enforcement would face a $25,000 fine. Hold on to that thought for when I start talking about the national... <clears throat> Actress Hillary Burton Morgan responded to Candace Cameron, Cameron Burr saying LGBT families won't be leads on the network. Won't she, be what? On the network. It's, they're talking about you know TV networks like ABC. Blah, blah, blah. Um, won't be leads on the network she left the Hallmark Channel for, calling the Full House star disgusting. During an interview with the Wall Street Journal, Burr discussed the network Great American Family, which also set to include Hallmark stars Deanka McKella and Lori Langland. Earlier this year, the Hallmark Channel released its first holiday film with uh, LGBTQ couples as its lead. Burr shared the same movie won't be made for Great American Family Channel, saying she believes the channel will keep traditional marriage at the core. Uh, Morgan said on Twitter in response to a headline about Burr's comment, I don't remember Jesus liking hypocrites like candy, but sure, make your money, honey. You ride that prejudice wave all the way to the bank. So, Ooh. I know. And then, you know, there was this story, um, and it's, it was a much longer piece, but I'm just going to briefly say this and let Keith do his wonderful who won the election stuff. Um, but it's about Jamaica and the problems that Jamaica has with LGBTQ people. And that, you know, a lot of people go there and they go to resorts and they never know what's actually going on mm -hmm. in Jamaica. And I'm doing this story because it was written by an American lesbian and it was, and, and, and Jamaica is her home. So like uh, millions of Americans, Jasmine Canick, Jamaica is my top destination in the Caribbean. But unlike millions of Americans, I don't just come to Jamaica to vacation and soak up the sun. As a black lesbian, for the past year I've traveled throughout Jamaica, bearing witness to modern day underground railroad while speaking to LGBTQ people about its about what it's like living in a country that seemingly encourages their murder. How cool, um, right? I know. So there is this whole, if you look her up, her name is Jasmine Canick, and she wrote this, uh, and she is a, um, a, a Jamaican woman who um, is doing a lot of work in Jamaica and working on the Underground Railroad and such. So um, you could look yeah. her up and find out more information about this if you wanted to. It was a very long piece, but I, I think it'd be worth your while if you're interested in yeah. this. Okay. We should be looking for more of those. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 
what is happening under the surface, right. particularly in countries that have a high degree of, of oppression, persecution. And they have so many gay, you know, the, those ships, they stop there all the time. And mm -hmm. That's tourists, you're giving us your dollars. That's right. a whole different. But and a lot of LGBTQ people yeah. go there too, so anyway. And an Olivia Cruise, the lesbian cruise line, stopped there. They stopped there. there. And none of the vendors would sell anything to them. Yeah. So, election night, you yes. knew I was going to get to it. It wasn't bad, it wasn't bad. There may not have been a red wave, but there was a lavender wave. <laughs> and let's start in our own home state, and hopefully none of us are going to choke up, but Becca Ballant. Yes. Yes. The first woman, first lesbian Jew to be elected in Vermont and sent to the U.S. Congress. And in her acceptance speech, she said, after 231 <laughs> years, Vermont has finally stepped up. So, and she was followed by Mike Pichek, who was elected yes. for treasurer. Okay, Becca won with 63% of the vote. Very good. Mike Pichek won with 66% of the vote. Sort of keep that figure in your head because all of the commentary, sort of looking at the, array, the races, the breakdowns, approximately 65% of the vote went to the Democrats, 35% went to the Republicans. That gives you an indicator of how much just down party ticket voting happened. So when we start looking at political initiatives here in Vermont, you can expect 35% Republican perspective, how much of that is sort of the alt-right election deniers. And when I went through and looked, there were some election deniers who were running. I don't see where any of them got elected but we're going to have to be watching. And there were some notable ones that went down. Looking at Proposition 5, reproductive liberty, it passed by approximately 77% of the vote, and it got support in all Vermont counts. And that goes to show you that even the Republican women who might have crossed voted over. Republican crossed over to vote. Absolutely. And that was sort of the strategy on a national level. You know, let, let's talk about the economy, let's talk about the, the issues of importance, but let's talk about Dobbs mm -hmm. and what that means. And it really did carry the night. Looking at the composition of our legislature, and this is the first time since 1966 that the balance has been super this, big. no, this lopsided. In the House, 104 Democrats, five progressive, three independents, 38 Republicans. Democrats alone, they have a supermajority yeah. because it's only 100 votes to override a veto. And the other two states with supermajorities are Michigan and what was the third? Pennsylvania, did they switch that? Pennsylvania flipped, but it wasn't a no, supermajority. No, maybe um, We're gonna have to go back Minnesota. I don't know. I can I look it up, Minnesota's. but go ahead. And, okay. and looking at our Senate, 22 Democrats, one progressive, seven Republicans, 20 is the magic number for a veto override. Mm. Okay, but here's the part that warms the cockles of my heart. <laughs> yes. Coming into our legislature, we are going to have 15 out LGBTQ nice. plus members. And there may be more that we just don't know yet. There will be 13 in the House, and one of them is Sadia Lamont, who oh, came yeah. out when we were moderating the candidates forum, yeah. which was a huge step. And another is Josie Levitt, whom exactly. we interviewed. And there are two in the Senate, which was, we also have two out LGBTQ plus states attorneys. These are the people setting the agendas, prosecuting case on a state level. One of them has already enacted, um, removed the bail provision because a lot, in many instances, 
imposing bail is sort of a class absolutely you know, process oh, totally. to totally. So looking at the national level, and oh my, wasn't it a long night? Oh, but a good one. Looking at if the Republicans do indeed get that slim majority in the House, some of the things that we might expect is they're not going to move the bill forward about access to PrEP and insurance companies providing coverage. Things that they're already signaling look for the Republican-led House to be putting some push on is, based on what you were saying, the Protect Children's Innocence Act, the No Gender Affirmation, Protection of Women and Girls in Sports, No Transgender Athletes. Um, looking at the Victory Fund, there were over 1,065 LGBTQ people who <coughs> ran for office. There was a record 436 who got elected. Wow. There was an out candidate in every state in the District of Columbia. And here are some of the notable races. And in our own backyard, Maura Healy, lesbian yes. governor of Massachusetts, Oregon, Tina Kotak, she pulled it out at the last minute. Yep. Lesbian governor of Oregon, yes. Despite a third party challenge. Exactly. They almost lost it for her. Well, that's why I said she pulled it out at the last minute. Jared Polis got reelected in Colorado. Looking to our neighbor at New Hampshire, mm -hmm. they elected James Rossiner, who is the first transgender man ever elected to a state legislature. And they re-elected Jerry Cannon, who was their first transgender woman in their legislature. Chris Pappas, who was their out gay representative, was re-elected with a strong majority, even though he was targeted. Looking in at Maine, Lori Osher, who we interviewed, who started the LGBTQ caucus, she got re-elected. It was did a the, good. It was a good night. Did the um. Uh, governor, uh, Democrat, get elected in Maine? Janet Mills. Yes, she did. She pulled up. I didn't put her down here because she's not lesbian. No, no, I just wondered. That <laughs> no, was she, just, I didn't hear that. So, no, yes, yeah. she did. Yeah, okay. By a wider majority than they thought she was going to have. Delaware, Sarah McBride, who was the first openly trans person elected to a state legislature, was reelected to their Senate. Zoe Zephyr will be the first out trans person to serve in the Montana legislature. Montana. I Ooh. know. Well, some of these are like, what? <laughs> uh, Democrat Eric Russell won his election for Connecticut treasurer. So, so Mike's going to have a colleague. Yeah. And it also made him the first black gay statewide office holder in the U.S. Wow. So. According to this, New York also had a supermajority. Oh, okay. Even though they had those four seats we lost through gerrymandering. Yeah. Well, and, and I've got, it, as, if time allows, I will touch on you that briefly. You still have time. Um, Long Beach, California, their mayor, Robert Garcia, became the first out LGBTQ plus immigrant elected to the Congress. California's 42nd district. Okay, and this is the one that, again, warmed my heart in Kansas. Sharice Davids, even though the redistricting and targeting her, she won her seat. She's going back. Um, in, in Texas, two Democrats, Christian Manuel Hayes and Venton Jones, have become the first out black LGBTQ men elected to the legislature. Texas. I'm going to have to do some more research and see if it's Austin or Houston. Probably, right? or Dallas, yeah. Okay, and, and this was sort of a long one, and it was, you know, there was a special election earlier this year, and Conturi Heron became the first out LGBTQ person ever elected to the Kentucky State wow. House. And she beat her opponent with seven, with 94% oh. of the vote. Wow. And she ran for re-election unopposed. <laughs> and she was, and part of this is she was the person responsible for the unanimous passage of Brianna's law 
that banned the no knock warrants in Louisville. So, in Florida, Michelle Rayner, civil rights attorney, first out black queer woman to win a seat in the Florida House. And actually, what was interesting is her Republican opponent ran his campaign from jail. <laughs> there we go. Mm. Sounds familiar. Mm. And again, in the special election earlier this year, Yolanda Jones became the first out black LGBTQ person ever elected yeah. to the Texas legislature. She has been reelected <laughs> very quickly because I want to <coughs> for the trivia. Trivia. Sean Patrick Maloney, Law. Democrat. Yeah. He lost. Part of it was redistricting, and a lot of it was credited. He was out working on every other, everybody else's campaign, and was presumptive about his reelectability. Hmm. So, and he, I think he was one of our longest yeah. out members of Congress. So, all right, the, get to that trivia. The boyfriend. trivia: the first openly LGBTQ person elected to. A state legislature in 1974 was... Elaine Noble. In Massachusetts, and she's, I included her because Becca Balance specifically said, this was one of my heroes, this was a trailblazer, this is one of the people responsible for my being here tonight. And so. I heard her speak in 1975 in Indiana, and she inspired me tremendously. So I'm so glad Becca mentioned oh, her. Right. She was a shero. And with that, honey. And she's still alive. Yeah, in Florida. We did okay. Let's keep up the good work. And remember to resist. Resist. <laughs>